The Defense Department's new Navy fleet plan could be a lot larger than anyone thought. Documents from the future Navy force study show the Navy could look toward a, three, a 530 ship fleet in the coming years. Captain Jerry Hendricks, U.S. Navy retired as vice president of the Telemus Group. Jerry, welcome. It's good to see you again. What do you see when you read the reports of what the various force constructs are suggesting the Defense Department might do next? One, uh, first of all, it's good to see you again, Francis. Uh, thank you for having me on. One, I see that there is real recognition now that we need a larger Navy, that there is a strategic requirement driven by the fact that we are in a great power competition with primarily China, with also Russia, and that uh, so we need a larger fleet and able to cover these emerging requirements. Also, I'm seeing that there's a recognition that we need a much larger fleet. So all the rumors now are not around the number 355, which has been in use for the past four years since December of 2015 or 2016. Um, but in fact, looking at something much larger than that, in uh, numbers in the 500 range, uh, I'm also seeing the fact that there's general growing acceptance of the need for a high-low mix, not only just the large combatants that we've depended on uh, for the last 70 years, but also smaller ships, frigates, corvettes, as well as unmanned platforms. And that's one of the key takeaways from virtually all these conversations is that unmanned must be part of the future fleet, de fleet design uh, and that those ships must be counted, which has been a major debate within naval circles as to whether we can count those ships as part of the overall battle force. You and others have been advocating the high-low mix. I think you used that phrase the first time you and I had a conversation about anything, and that's probably 10 years ago, Jerry. What does that mean in the context of what technology is available today versus a decade ago when people were looking at this same issue? Well, the high-low mix debate actually goes back, you know, to the late 1960s, early 1970s. Uh, you know, uh, Chief of Naval Operations Elmo Zumwalt talked about the high-low mix at that point in time, but it's a, it's a need, it's a recognition of the need to have a balance between war-winning capabilities, which we generally assign to the high end, while also having the peace preservation aspects or capacity that the Navy is required to cover down on the 18 to 19 maritime regions of the world where the United States has defined national interests. What's interesting about this, of course, all your low end can, it's not like they can uh, not be useful to us in war. They have to help us by providing additional missile launch space, vertical launch system tubes uh, to carry the missiles, but at the same time that they would be cheaper to buy in order to uh, be out and about uh, in the world uh, you know, providing security and defending international norms like a free sea and free navigation. So you cannot do that. Obviously, if you wanted to have a 500-ship Navy, they can't all be aircraft carriers, would be far too expensive, nor could they be rowboats because they wouldn't be combat credible. All of this analysis is about trying to find that sweet spot where you have combat credible low-end forces that can supplement the high-end. So regarding the cost, where does the money come from and what money is necessary based on what we know about what the Navy potentially will be doing here? Is this even possible uh, dollar-wise, Jerry? Well, it's going to have to start being possible, and Secretary of Defense Esper has signaled that he's recognizing this. During his recent speech at the Rand Institute in California, he talked about the fact, or at least in his prepared remarks, that the Navy's overall shipbuilding budget was going to go from 11% of the Navy budget to 13%, which equates to something just above $4 billion more in shipbuilding, which is roughly what we need to begin adding two to three more ships per year, um, specifically in the high end. If I was to build low end uh, frigates or corvettes, then I could get that number up much quicker. Um, and so there is general recognition where that dollars come from whether it's an overall increase in the top line of DOD or whether the secretary, because he's taken uh, personal uh, control over this process, if the secretary moves money from other budgets, meaning either other services or out of his own OSD budget into the Navy, that's for up to him to decide, but it, the, it, this will not come without a cost. One of the ongoing debates of the past decade, Jerry, has been what happens to the carrier fleet and its size. Uh, Defense News writes about this future Navy force study. Uh, as of the April drafts, both the Cape and Hudson Institute teams were supportive of shrinking the number of supercarriers 
to nine from the current 11. That means you have eight actually in the water at any given time, one in dock. Where are you on that in, in that debate, Jerry? Well, of course, I've been uh, part of this debate about the future of the aircraft carrier since around 2013 when I published a paper calling into question the relative cost of the Ford class aircraft carrier and its relative uh, relevance given the fact that its air wings range has shortened. If the carrier is to remain relevant into the future, then significant changes to include the inclusion of unmanned platforms, long range strike platforms in the carrier air wing will be necessary. I think what we're seeing here is a general consensus around the fact that the Ford class itself has become too expensive. We've built a platform that's too expensive to lose uh, with each one of them coming in around $15 billion each. And I think there's gonna be a real push to find something that's perhaps smaller, less expensive, and yet can still hold the 65 aircraft that are currently embarked aboard our supercarriers today. So I think that that is the plan going forward. I think we're also looking at plans to make greater use of the smaller carriers that we built normally to work with the Marine Corps, the LHAs and LHDs, uh, to be able to ferry F-35Bs, uh, uh, an interesting uh, somewhat shortened range uh, joint strike fighter that is stealthy, uh, you know, to and from the areas of combat and competition. So we're gonna see some differences in employment of aircraft carriers, but I think we're gonna see a difference in design of super carriers coming soon. Jerry Hendricks, thanks very much as always. Great to have you back in the program. Great to be here with you, Francis.